As a journalist, I'm really looking forward to the next presentation. Uh, Mr. Stephen Baker is, uh, as I said, uh, an English barrister and Jersey advocate. He is senior partner of Baker and Partners Jersey, uh, which is a Channel Island. Uh, he is a specialist in concluding investigations into the flow of suspected corrupt payments made to politicians through Jersey. He also has expertise in cases involving complex fraud and money laundering. And Mr. Beck will now talk about some practical experiences in an offshore jurisdiction. The floor is yours. Good. Thank you. Good. I, he's stolen my first line. Because <laughs> I was going to say that um, I hoped that by the end of my talk we might have some grounds for optimism. And I don't think that the, the Lesotho case, for instance, is a particularly negative case. I think it's a great case because a small jurisdiction took on some big companies, it took on a particularly a Canadian firm and it stuck it to them and that Canadian firm suffered consequences and Lesotho said we won't tolerate corruption and I think that a starting point is for, for me is that it is possible to do something and that small countries can also play their part uh, as well as the big ones and Every jurisdiction needs to address the issue that it, face, that it faces particularly, and it needs to take steps to deal both with corruption and with tax evasion, which are two topics which I've become very familiar uh, over the last 10 or 15 years. I'm an English lawyer, and I'm a Jersey advocate. I'm a litigation lawyer, means I'm a courtroom specialist. I've watched certain of the speakers who obviously speak very regularly strutting around the floor very confidently a bit like american game show hosts <laughs> well <coughs> i'm a i'm a courtroom lawyer and we're, we're told to stand still near our lectern and that's where i'm going to stay for the next 45 minutes unless i need to start dodging things um i've had the great good fortune as i say to um have a lot of experience on um, corruption, asset recovery and tax evasion. That's what I'm going to talk to you about. Um, I've had the privilege to act for the Republic of Brazil in a case I'll talk to you about, as well as the National Accountability Bureau of Pakistan. Yes, there is one. <laughs> um, <coughs> and the Kenyan Anti-Corruption Commission, as well as wor working with Tim Daniel and others on a, a series of Nigerian cases. But I guess that the first thing that lots of you will be thinking is, who on earth is that bloke over there and where is he from? Um, well, I live on Jersey. It's not New Jersey, which is in the United States. It's the old Jersey, the one that New Jersey is named after. And it's a tiny little island off the coast of France. You can see France from um, Jersey, but everybody or virtually everybody speaks English, save for a few old people who speak a, a form of patois French and it's one of those really weird places that ended up with the with Queen Elizabeth II as the um, head of um, head of state and it's also ended up with a very substantial finance industry and I thought it might help you just a little bit if I told you told you how that happened and it, it's a joy to be here in Norway, it's the purest country in the world. There's no corruption, there's no tax <laughs> evasion. <coughs> well, I, I can tell you that, in fact, the, the Norwegians are directly responsible for the tax haven, which is Jersey. Because um, <coughs> well over a thousand years ago, the Vikings went down to the north coast of France and they conquered uh, part of it. And it was called Normandy after the Norsemen, after the, after the, the men from the north. And Jersey was part of, I'm exaggerating, part of Norway. Of course it wasn't, but it was part of the Duke of Normandy's territories. And the Duke of Normandy in 1066 invaded England and conquered England. So every good Englishman will tell you that, uh, sorry, every good Jerseyman will tell you that uh, Jersey conquered England. <coughs> but it was a, a long time ago. Do, 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 do people like um, Hollywood films, like the Robin, the Robin Hood films, the Kevin Costner 
Robin Hood film. Well, he fought against King John, didn't he? Bad King John in England. That John lost all of the Norman ter all, all of the Norman territories, all of the f France in 1204. He lost it, and for reasons nobody knows, Jersey, this little island of France, remained loyal to King John, and he's called Good King John. Would you believe it? In uh, in Jersey. And John was so pleased with the Jersey citizens that he said to them, thanks guys, that's really great. I don't know why you've stayed loyal to me, but because you have, I'm going to give you a number of um, rights. He said, firstly, you can raise your own taxes and I won't tax you. You can look after yourself, something which didn't really matter in 1204. And he said, secondly, um, my army will protect you. Whenever you need protection, the English army will be there. And there it stood for... 600, 700 years until 1940 when the German army had gone through France and was on the doors of Jersey and Jersey said to England for the first time in six, 700 years, help us, help us, we need an army. And Winston Churchill made a very famous speech which was, we will defend the beaches of Kent, which wasn't much use to Jersey because it was 120 miles <coughs> <laughs> south of the beaches of Kent. Of course a very sensible military decision but um, not much good for the Jersey people. Then after the Second World War, some bright spark in Jersey realised that in 1204, King John had said to them, well, you can raise your own taxes. And they'd always followed the English tax rate until then. And somebody realised, we've had a bad war, we've got no industry, we're in a terrible state, um, but we can raise our own tax. And in 50 years, an enormous financial services business has been developed on this t tiny little island, 12 miles or 13 miles by 7 at its widest, with very, very large sums of money on it, and what you're, you're calling a typical tax haven. Now, the, word ta the words tax haven never get used in Jersey. They're terrible words, and the, the, the proper description is a well-regulated, low-tax area. <coughs> so that's, that, that's what we're... That's where I'm from, that's where I live and I, pra and I practice from. And I, I thought carefully about what I was going to say today and I listened to the speakers from the Australian yesterday, uh, Jason and our American colleague in the afternoon and I listened to Jack and I then read through my PowerPoint slides and realised actually I've got it, I'm just about in the game as to what I want to say and what I should say. And so what I'd like to do is pull together what I think they said and what I want to say to you. And then I want to really get into some practical examples of why I say there are, there are some grounds to be, to be positive about things. Firstly, picking up on what Jack said and responsibility. It's a responsibility of lawyers, it's a responsibility of jurisdictions to deal with the issues of corruption which we face, which the whole world faces, and those jurisdictions who have a rule of law and have a judge that you can trust and system of judges that you can trust have a responsibility, one, to prosecute those who misuse their financial services, and two, to put their courts at the uh, use of those that want to recover assets, and so that for those of us <clears throat> well, the Norwegians that are here, if your companies pay bribes, prosecute them. If your citizens evade tax, then prosecute them. If the money goes through London, then there's a responsibility on the English to be prosecuting those that use their banks to launder the, eva the tax evaded money or corrupt money. And if it comes to Jersey or other centres, then it's their responsibility to make sure that, their that those that misuse their financial services are prosecuted and that assets are recovered. And picking up on, as Jason said, the, the, our Australian academic said, it's no use just having laws. The international community has been very good at putting pressure on all sorts of uh, different jurisdictions to introduce laws, and most countries now have the laws. How they're enforced is entirely patchy, and there's a responsibility on countries to make sure not only they have their laws, but that they're used and that they're tested and that there are proper audit, regulatory audit of um, whether laws are carried out. And I asked Jason yesterday how the Jersey Trust and Company Service Providers perform, performed on his tests. Do you remember him trying to set up the offshore companies and like? He said 100, they got 100%. They always wanted 
a passport and a utility bill. Now, that's not a complete answer. Of course it isn't, because he also told me the Seychelles and Caymans passed, which astonished me. Um, but it, it's important to have laws properly tested. And if you, you'd be surprised by this, but if you went and walked around the streets of Jersey, um, the complaint you'd hear from the financial services industry is there's too much regulation. There's too much regulation. The regulators all over us. We can't do business because they're insisting on us complying with um, all sorts of international standards and the like. I'm not here, I'm far from it, to tell you that Jersey's a perfect jurisdiction. Of, 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 of course it's not. Um, but what is important, I, I repeat, for the last time, is that laws are enforced and that people take this all seriously. One of the last things I, I wanted just to comment upon briefly before I move to um, perhaps some practical examples is this. I think that it's important that you think about offshore more broadly. What, what is offshore? Because it's a mistake to think that offshore is your typical tropical island with some palm trees and some banks. And to think, well, that's, if, 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 we wipe out, if we wipe out all of those, we're going to solve the world's problems. In my view, it's a lot more complicated than that. And the city of London is offshore to almost everybody here, as is New York, as is the Netherlands, as is Ireland. And it's a, a much more complicated problem than saying, oh, these little islands cause all this trouble, because you need to be focusing on the, um, on the big jurisdictions in the first instance. If you don't persuade the Americans, and if you don't persuade the British to shift their position, then it's not realistic to think that small jurisdictions are going to shift without that uh, international um, move. Not all, I'm now going to talk about um, traditional offshore centres, what you imagine to be, off, to be offshore centres. Firstly, I want to say this, that you can go to London and get your shell company, your trust, and all the services, effectively all the services that you want from London. And it's not even regulated. The trust and corporate service providers aren't regulated in London. And it's important, in my view, that there is proper regulation so that laws are tested. But it was said yesterday that we're, I think, 900,000 BVI companies, or something like that. Well, there's a reason that there's 900,000 BVI companies, and that's because the British Virgin Islands Company Registry doesn't have the beneficial owner of those companies. That's why people incorporate in the British Virgin Islands. Because if you want to find out the owner of a British Virgin Islands company, firstly, you have to get some information from the registry, which will tell you who incorporated the company. Then you have to go to the person who incorporated the company and find out from them who it was who incorporated the company. Normally you can do it, it's just difficult. It often takes, it, it takes you, you have to go to the BVI first, then you have to go to the country in which the corporate service provider was that incorporated the British Virgin Island company. There's a lot of Isle of Man companies as well, I don't know the number, but hundreds of thousands, and that's for the same reasons. Jersey, there's a little over 30,000 Jersey companies. The reason that there's 30,000 Jersey companies is the registrar knows who the beneficial owner of the company is. So you need a court order. If you can get a court order to get the company registry documents, then you will get it. And the point I'm making at this stage is there are differences between the offshore centres. They're very competitive and they're reacting to the international pressure that's being put on them in different ways. Some of them are really just a, a rush for cheap, cheap and cheerful, to do everything as cheaply as they can and as in a slipshod a fashion as they can. Others are taking things much more seriously and are trying to regulate properly, trying to move with international standards. And one of the questions I was asked is what the outlook is for offshore financial centres. Well, I think the outlook for those centres that have moved for cheap and cheerful and doing it for nothing is bleak. And you see Liechtenstein 
is probably the best example of that at the moment, where all of the bank records from the princely court, princely um, bank were taken, and now Liechtenstein facing massive uh, problems with um, with the international community because it, it really didn't address issues such as tax evasion, such as um, the corruption and the like. Other offshore centres, well, there may be quite a bit of time for them, I would have thought, um, as long as they apply proper international standards and seek to um, do what the, the international community wants. Well, enough, enough of generalisation about offshore centres. I, I'll do my best to, um, to answer any questions that you've got, but I'll make it plain. I'm not a tax lawyer. I'm not avoiding the, <laughs> I'm not evading or avoiding the issue. But I'm not, a, I'm not a tax lawyer, I'm a courtroom lawyer. And what I thought I'd do for the rest of the, the time that I've got is speak to you about three cases about which I've had some personal experience, uh, tell you about them, and hopefully grounds for some optimism. Now, that means I want to go straight to the back of my uh, slides. Is, is this the thing? I'll flip through. There you go. There we go. This gentleman is called... Philip de Figueiredo, and I'm a typical courtroom lawyer. I'm trained in the English system, so I'll act for anybody who pays me money. That's the gist of the um, that's the gist of the English <laughs> system. But I acted for this man for a short while before I got sacked, and I'm not allowed to tell you why. But I got sacked. <coughs> he um, is an accountant, and he's presently on bail in Queensland. And I don't imagine he wanted to go to Queensland very much because he's charged with fraud upon the Australian revenue. And he worked for a company called Strachan's SA, I think that's Society Anonyme or something like that, um, which was a, a company based in Switzerland. He's a Jerseyman, but Strachan's SA, the company, moved to... Switzerland from Jersey and some say there may have been some connection between the introduction of money laundering laws in Jersey and the move but I couldn't couldn't possibly say but they went to Switzerland and they sent faxes to Australia they sent emails to Australia and various people visited Australia and Strachan's was a, 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 com a trust and company service provider through an, account through an accountancy firm. Some of you may have heard of Operation Wickenby. I, I, don't, I don't know. It's a very high-profile Australian revenue investigation and it, run by the tax office, the federal police and the crime commission to identify taxpayers who have abused the tax system. And... For reasons I don't fully understand, the Australians made clear several of, of the persons who were under investigation in this tax fraud, and they included, most famously, Paul Crocodile Dundee Hogan, who uh, pu publicly said something which sounds hugely fair, which was he said that if I'm guilty of tax evasion, so are several lawyers and accountants. <laughs> and uh, I think his affairs were settled, weren't they, <laughs> with, the, with the revenue without the prosecution of any lawyers or any accountants. Well, this is similar to the UBS case that was being spoken to about yesterday, save that Strachan's SA, I think, were a lot less sophisticated than the Union Bank of Switzerland. They didn't, for instance, travel across borders with... Uh, encrypted laptops, in fact quite the opposite, which is why I think the Australian Revenue knew uh, Mr Hogan was uh, in, the, uh, in the investigation because a member of Strachan's travelled to Melbourne and he booked into the Four Seasons Hotel and he was, I'm told, in the presidential suite and he was there at a very unfortunate time because the Australian um, authorities had persuaded the Swiss authorities to search an office in Switzerland. And so 
one imagines that the telephone lines were ringing quite uh, frequently between Switzerland and uh, and Australia, and you can imagine perhaps a, uh, a telephone conversation, something like this. You won't believe what's happened. They've come through the doors. They're looking at the records. What are, what are we going to do? And the uh, employee of Strachan's in the presidential suite in Melbourne is in Australia while the Australians are in Switzerland. You, c you can sort of imagine what it must have been like as his blood ran cold. And uh, the Australians found out that he was in, in the hotel and so they thought, well, we might as well go and arrest him while he's here. And there was a wonderful, there's a wonderful piece of evidence from a receptionist at the hotel in Melbourne which said, well, a call came through from Switzerland. I put it through to the room that Mr. X was in upstairs. And it, I don't know how long it went on, but what I can tell you is that there was very shortly thereafter, there was a telephone call which said, can you send a shredder to the room? <laughs> <laughs> I, don't know what he, I don't know what they were doing with the, with, with the shredder, but... <clears throat> <coughs> Wherever he shredded, there was a, a laptop which wasn't encrypted, which gave the Australian Revenue an enormous amount of information about the, um, the, the Australians who were secreting their um, money through Strachan's in, um, <coughs> in Australia. Mr. De Figueiredo has recently pleaded guilty in Australia to uh, tax evasion. And interestingly, one of the things that they were doing was the credit card trick that was being spoken about yesterday, where you give an Australian citizen a credit card, he can go and take money out of a hole in the wall, he can buy, for go he can buy goods in Australia, and the credit card being paid offshore, which seems an astonishingly unsophisticated way to try and um, defraud somebody in another country. And the idea that anybody ever thought you could travel to Australia and encourage Australian citizens to defraud the um, revenue of Australia and it not be a crime. It, it, it begs belief, and picking up on what um, was said yesterday, what did the Union Bank of Switzerland bankers think when they went to the United States, falsely ticked the, um, the, 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 the boxes which immigration gave them as to what they were doing in the United States, so claiming they're on holiday, going in, meeting rich, rich Americans, telling them how to evade tax, and they go, oh, but, but it's not, a, not an offence in Switzerland. It, it, um, it beggars belief that anybody ever thought that. Um, and certainly that's, the UBS bankers have learned that. This is something which um, the, um, this Jersey account, he's a Jersey account running for, a, run out, run, running or working for um, Switzerland that he learned, and they, they ran, through the Jersey courts, this argument. But it's a tax offence. What's tax got to do? What's tax got to do with us? It's a principle of international law that you don't enforce other countries' tax bills, and that's that's still a general principle of, of most countries. You don't enforce another person's tax bills. And the Jersey court said, no, no, no. That's that might be right in terms of enforcing another country's tax bill but you still can't commit crimes against another country and just say, well, it's, it's only the revenue that, um, that, 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 that is the victim and therefore we won't do anything about it. And so if I said there's some, some optimism, well, there you are, that's an offshore centre extraditing a man to Australia for tax fraud. And I, I don't imagine many of you would have thought that an offshore lawyer would be coming in and telling you that that sort of thing is possible. And he, De Figueredo was extradited to Australia. Another accountant called Peter Michel was sentenced to six years uh, in prison in Jersey for laundering the proceeds of tax evasion from the UK. So a minor, a minor story, but a little bit of optimism. Somebody being prosecuted. And importantly, the message going out to other people in Jersey and actually other... Uh, what you would call traditional tax havens. You better be careful with this. You don't want to be serving six years imprisonment for laundering the proceeds of tax evasion, or you don't want to be put on a plane to Australia, or worse, the United States, for laundering the proceeds of tax evasion. So he's going to be sentenced in March 2000. 
and 13. But there's, a, there's another point, isn't there, to this? You wouldn't really want to be an offshore accountant in front of a Queensland jury explaining how you've sent false invoices to be put before the, 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 the Australian revenue. I'm going to do the next, this case quite quickly because it's the last one I want to talk to you about a bit more. This is a, an Indian businessman called Raj Bajwani and this, this is a, an astonishing story. Um, you probably won't believe me because I'm an offshore lawyer but I'm going to tell you the story anyway. Um, Raj Bajwani wanted to do, he's a very, very wealthy Indian businessman. He spends his time between India, Nigeria and London and he his main source of income was that he had the concession for Tata trucks in India and he wanted to sell Tata trucks to Nigeria when General Abacho was president. He had a problem in that another country had the um, contract that he wanted which was supp to supply trucks to the Nigerian military but he had a stroke of luck. Not many of us would call this a stroke of luck, but it was a stroke of luck to Bojwani because a bacha, you may remember, executed the poet Ken Sarawiva, and that, that appalled quite a lot of people, and very sanctions were put on Nigeria, and they were kicked out of the Commonwealth for a while, and that gave Bojwani the opportunity because the company that had the contract for the trucks was stuck with the sanctions. So he went to um, talk to Abacha's finance minister, a man called Arnie. And you've, if you, you've all entered contracts before, haven't you? Everybody here has entered contracts. You buy a house or um, um, get on your, on, your, on your bus ticket, that's a, con that's a contract. Well, this contract went something like this. Mr. Bojwani, I'd like to sell you some trucks, the finance minister. How many do you want to sell? Well, how many do you want? Well, we could probably do with X total. How much... Uh, uh, Bajwani... Sorry, Finance Minister. How much will that cost? Bajwani, $75 million. Fi Finance Minister, no it won't. It'll cost $150 million. <laughs> so a well-known method of negotiation between at arm's length. <coughs> so... Bojwani says, yeah, all right, fine, great, 150, I'd have settled for 75, but 150 sounds good. I'm, the number's about right, I'm not making this up, the number's about right. Arnie then says, about that $75 million excess. <coughs> and he says, that's got to go via, via a circuitous route to two Swiss bank accounts. And... The Swiss bank accounts are called Kaiser and Sosa. Any of you Hollywood fans? Yeah. The usual suspects, Kevin Spacey, Kaiser Sosa, who turns out, is he Satan? Is not the suggestion that this evil character, I promise you, I promise you this is true, two coded Swiss bank accounts called Kaiser and Sosa. So he sends the trucks to Nigeria 150 million dollars comes I think through London and then into a Jersey bank account and we're from where immediately 75 million dollars goes in split in half half to Kaiser half to Soiser those are coded accounts for the um, a batch, two of a batch's children his, his sons everyone's happy how could anybody un be unhappy a batch's kids are happy the Nigerian military have got $75 million worth of trucks. Bajwani's got his profits. What could, be, what could be wrong with the world? Well, Abacha, Abacha died, and I know that, I guess Tim Daniel spoke about Abacha a couple of days ago, did he? I would imagine. Did he, did he tell you the story about how Abacha died? <laughs> uh, he's a very, very pucker English lawyer. He wouldn't tell you this. <coughs> There's a, story that Abacha, there's a story that General Abacha was killed by Mossad. I've never, under, I've never understood that. I, uh, I don't know what he did to the Israelis in particular. But my favourite story is that he died of an overdose of Viagra. 
entertaining uh, ladies of the night, which um, I think, well, at least he got some pleasure out of life. It's a good thing. <coughs> anyway, a batcher died, a government, a government passed, and then another government came in, which very rarely had the political will to go after the Abatchers. And various journalists got in, interested in the, um, in the case, and the Financial Times ran a whole page, full, full, full scat page of um, allegations about General Abatcher. And they named the accounts Kaiser and Soiser. And one can imagine Mr. Bojwani getting a bit nervous as he saw this, read the Financial Times, saw Kaiser and Soiser. And he rang the bank in Jersey, and nobody knows what the discussion was between him and the bank who answered the phone, because nobody can remember who answered the phone and the like. But effectively what he did was clear out the bank account. There was $45 million left in the bank account, and they had a banker's draft for $45 million made out to bearer, which, <laughs> can you imagine? Can you imagine if the, that had fallen in the wrong hands? But anyway, they couldn't, they couldn't deposit it anywhere. Nobody would accept a $45 million bank's draft, strangely, made out to bearer. <laughs> but they put it back into accounts in companies completely unconnected with the one that, the, that it had come out from, and then invested it in Indian Millennium deposits, something I'd never heard of until the time until we had to look at this. But... This was uncovered. Jersey investigated it, the offshore islands, very strange. And they decided they were going to prosecute Mr. Bojwani. But Mr. Bojwani has never been to Jersey. Um, he flits between London and Nigeria and India. And by coincidence, they found out that he was on a plane traveling through London from Geneva to Chicago. So he's nabbed on the plane, arrested on the plane at Heathrow, sent to Jersey and tried, and f f ran every argument under the sun. He did everything he could to have this um, case dismissed. Weeks before the trial, the Nigerian Attorney General wrote and demanded the evidence back from the Jersey authorities. The Nigerians were brilliant. They provided the contract documents, they provided witnesses, they fully cooperated. But weeks before the trial, um, or months before the trial, asked for the documents back. Anybody got any guess as to how that was dealt with? They kept copies and sent the documents back and prosecuted him on the copies. But um, he, he was sentenced, I think he got six years, six years imprisonment and £26 million confiscated from him and repatriated to Nigeria. So some grounds for optimism misuse of offshore services, misuse of banking facilities, but some responsibility taken and a prosecution. And Mr. Bojwani, having never been in Jersey, spending some time in one of its, well, its only facility. And the last case I'm going to talk about is um, Paolo Malouf. And um, I think I was in lots of trouble because I sent my slides to the organisers so late, but this was because I was waiting for um, a judgment in this case before I sent my slides, and the judgment came in last Friday. And Paolo Malouf is a very wealthy South American businessman. He's, he was the mayor of Sao Paulo, um, and this he, he's facing trial in Brazil for an enormous fraud where the totals are <coughs> believe the Brazilians are asking for with penalties repayment of 1.5 billion US dollars. He is also wanted in New York for reasons I'll explain to you for money laundering through New York and there was a trial in Jersey which ended last week with the judgment last week with him ordered to pay back 10.5 million dollars, which he stole in five weeks, which I'll tell you about, which we're expecting to go up to it's about 36 million dollars with, comp with compound interest. Well, how did this case end up to be tried on a little offshore island? Well, 
Maloof was mayor of Sao Paulo for the second time in the mid 1990s, and he came out of power in I think it was about 1996. And I had the good fortune of acting acting for Brazil in this case. He came out of power in 1996, and he built, or the rather the municipality of Sao Paulo built while he was mayor. Um, a motorway, a highway through the middle of Sao Paulo called the Avenue Aspreda. And it was alleged that he, the company, it was alleged that the company that did the work, the engineering company, over invoiced by some 90%. So a check would be made out to the construction company and it would be in a very, very large sum. Immediately, the head contractor would make out checks totaling 90% to subcontractors and pay it down to subcontractors. They had access to the subcontractors' checkbooks and made out, then made out checks with, we don't know exactly how this happened, but we had some of the checks some of them to cash, some of them just blank to a total of 90% again. So, sorry, they, that's right, they paid 100% down to the, um, of what was owed to the subcontractors on invoices. Then 90% came back in on false checks. In Brazil, they have a secondary market for foreign exchange through people called Dolieros, so unlicensed foreign exchange brokers. And those checks were deposited amongst a range of unlicensed foreign exchange dealers. You could never, you could never track that. It's just that's impossible to track effectively. It's gone. But what happened was that once you paid that money to people in Brazil, they hold accounts in the United States in U.S. dollars from which they can pay dollars. It's quite complicated. No, no Brazilian currency moves from Brazil to the United States. There's no cross-border movement. The reals stay in Brazil, but the dollar, the dealer has bank accounts in the US with dollars in, so there's complete disconnect between Brazil and the United States. But money was paid into a bank account called Chinani in New York, in a bank in New York, and that account could be tied to Malouf in various ways. One of the ways was he paid one of his bills at Sotheby's, the auction house, from that account. And we, we got hold of Malouf's Sotheby's account, which you would have loved to have seen. It was fantastic. If you, if you can imagine a man more corrupt than this man, I can't imagine looking at his Renoirs and his Magritte's and his <laughs> anything he wanted, this man could have. So powerful. And the money then went from the accounts in New York to bank accounts in companies' names in Jersey, then to another company's name in Jersey, and then it went through a unit trust, about which I could talk for a long time, and was invested back into Brazil. So the money was stolen from the Brazilian taxpayer, and then through the use of offshore accounts, including offshore New York, into Jersey, into a unit trust, back into Brazil. How could they tie it to Malouf, you might say? Well, there's one astonishing document in the case, because the fraud was so big, you couldn't possibly keep it in your head. There was too much dishonesty going on. There needed to be some records, and somebody and anonymously posted to the a uh, prosecutor in Brazil, a series of documents. And one of the documents, I mean, the, the prosecutor's looking at them going, what, a, what on earth are these documents? But they worked out that at the top of the document were payments from the municipality of Sao Paulo to the contractor. And then there were some deductions for tax. And then there was a sum which said, sum owing, sum owed. And then there was a series of payments in reals. was, I think, 15 payments in reals down the left-hand column of a page. 
a US dollar conversion rate and then a series of 15 US dollar numbers and of the 15 US dollar numbers 13 of them matched exactly the deposits in the New York bank account that I've told you about. So they went, what on earth? What, why would there be this sheet of paper with 13 payments on it in dollars matching deposits into a New York bank account? What's that all about? And then they looked at the top of the document and they worked out, quite complicated calculations, that that represented to the penny what was paid from the municipality of Sao Paulo to the contractor and then they worked out that the sum that went into the New York bank account was exactly 20% of the payments from the municipality to the contractor and the, the case really was presented on that can't be nobody could have made that up, that can't be a forgery, it's just too unbelievably coincidental to be anything other than true but what 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 can you learn, what can you learn from this? How did Brazil work out that what the numbers on the right hand side meant? That the numbers to the how, how did New York get in touch with Brazil, and how did Jersey get in touch with? How did it all get put together? Well, it's a good example of the money laundering laws working properly, and investigations in different jurisdictions actually working with each other asking each other questions because there was a Jersey investigation because Malouf had a lot of money in Jersey, why would a, 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 a Brazilian politician have a lot of money in Jersey? Look, all of this money's come from uh, New York, well we'll ask the New York um, Attorney General, can you find out what this is about? He finds out what this is about and then Brazil get put in touch with the United States, get him put in touch with Jersey and together countries taking responsibility for their financial problems and their woes, there's a result. How many of these cases do we get a year? When was the last case that you can remember that actually went to trial and there was a, and there was a verdict or when there was, there was a judgment? Anybody with the, since the Lesotho one, when, anybody got another one to name? Bit miserable, isn't it? Bit miserable. They're very, very rare that these things, that there are judgments in these things. But I suppose my optimistic message, well, it's happened here, so maybe it can happen again if those people who think in the right way work together properly. Is that right? Yeah. yeah thank you. Perfect. Okay.